but she did a The Edmond is a synagogue class day, graciously sponsored by Mrs. Paula and Victor Mizrahi, Lailu Nishmat, Abraham Ben Miriam, Alava Shalom, on the occasion of his Askara today. We also dedicating today show for the Refuah Shalema of Shalomo Ben Rahel, Sarah Basilia, and uh, Hannah Bat Shani. The Lighthouse Live Video Feed sponsorship of today, dedicated to Ailu Nishmat, Deborah Feige, Bat Shemuel, Ora Deborah, Bat Shemuel, Esther Rivka, Bat Abraham, Monica Miriam, Bat Fani, and Menachem Mendel, Ben El Hanan. The iTorah.com sponsorship of today for the Shiduchim of Nehamadina, Bat Hanabati, Eliyahu Haim Ben Esther, Eliyahu Rafael Ben Farha, Rahel Penina, Bat Deni, Sarasiha, Bat Sofi. As the Kahal Kadosh knows, Be'ezat Hashem, this coming Sunday evening will be to Bishvat, Rosh Hashanah, Lailanot, the new year for the trees, Eid El Shahar, which is a definitely a beautiful celebration, and Be'ezat Hashem, between Sunday and Monday, will talk about it, God willing. Now, this particular perasha, perasha Bishalah, we did speak about it several times during the week, but perhaps i like to highlight one additional point in honor of Shabbat Shira. The Pirasha begins by he, Beshallah Paro et Aam, Belonaham Elohim, Derecheres Pelishtim, Kikarovu, Ki Amar Elohim, Perinahem Aam, Birotam Milhama, the third Pasha of Misraim, the third Pasuk, by Yasev Elohim et Aam. Now, here is the question why the Torah? in the first Pasuk, when talks about the Jewish people, calls the Jewish people et ha'am. Shouldn't the Pasuk says, Bayhi b'shalach paro et b'nei Israel, or am Israel? The Pasuk says, et ha'am. Another Pasuk says, peni nahem ha'am. The third Pasuk says, Bayasev Elohim et ha'am. So we heard this the other night in the beautiful Siyu Mashas, uh, that we had in memory of Rabbi Oziel, alav shalom. And Baruch Hashem, there were many, many, many speakers, so I cannot remember who said who and who said what. But Baruch Hashem, we heard beautiful words of Hizuk, and perhaps the message of the Torah is telling us a very important historical fact. We left Egypt, correct? In Perashah Shelah, Perashah Beshalah, rather, is when we are ready are leaving Egypt, and then we travel seven days, and then we come to the splitting of the Red Sea. So what does it mean? That as of now, we did not receive the Torah. What does it mean? That when the Torah is going to be given to Am Israel, next week's Torah portion, but we need to understand chronologically from today's perasha that we left Egypt, Till next week's Torah portion that we arrive to Mount Sinai, we're talking about seven weeks went by. The 50 days that are known as the counting of Sefirat HaOmer. So what does it mean? What was the main goal? The main goal was not to leave Egypt. The main goal of leaving Egypt was what? Receive the Torah. So maybe the Torah is hinting to us that Am Israel without the Torah is another nation of the world. And that's what the Torah is trying to tell us. Yes, we were called Jewish people because we were under the leadership of Moshe, Aharon, and Miriam. But did that change us? Like the Torah will change us? Obviously not. For this reason, the Pasuk says in the beginning, Ha'am, the nation. We were a nation. When our beauty and greatness and, and holiness will become more enhanced in next week Torah portion, when the Pasuk says, These are all verses. The first verse says, You are the chosen nation. You are my firstborn. You are a nation of Kohanim. What does it mean? A nation of holiness. And it is true. Today, I read this yesterday. Today, 
they finally are coming to realize that the coronavirus, which is regretfully affecting the world, we cannot be oblivious. There are basically, there is no continent that can say that we have no fear. In Europe, they have over three dozen cases. I hope that in America, we have nothing, but there were a couple of suspicious uh, places. So, and we don't even know what's really going on in China. So one Goy professor of a university in Spain, he made a study and he says, does not surprise me that this is what's going on in that part of the world. He says, why? Very simple, he says. The way that this nation eats, especially when it comes to the animals, they eat animals that are alive. This is the reality, Rabotai. I'm not trying to kid you, but I'm telling you the emet. And it's a known fact that it says that they eat wild animals. They eat animals that carry their own diseases, you know, and many other things that are out of respect to the kahal because you're eating and we are learning Torah. I shouldn't be more graphic in how they eat. But it's a known fact. And this is a Gentile professor in a university in Spain, I believe, who wrote an article yesterday. Now, the Torah, let's go back to the Torah now. In the infinite wisdom of Hashem establishes something known in the world has Shiva Mizvot Bene Noah, the seven Noahide laws. The seven Noahide laws are established by the Torah in order to preserve the well-being of the world, the sanctity of mankind, including Goim. You know, many times people erroneously believe that Goim have a free ride. Gentiles have a free ride in the world. They don't have a free ride. Every citizen of the world must follow the seven universal laws for mankind. Not to kill, not to steal, not to commit idolatry, to believe in God, the establishment of the judicial court system, immorality, including same gender relationships. It's not only a prohibition for the Jewish people, it's a prohibition even for Goim. We need to understand this, that the Goim also carry a certain responsibility in preserving the normal decency of the world. That's what Sefer HaHinuch writes. And therefore, what is Misvah number seven? Ever minahai, the prohibition of eating animals while they are alive. Now, you can believe it or not. I'm gonna go back to one week's perasha to see the relationship between eating raw food, raw flesh, or animals, and the coronavirus. It's mentioned. You just need to find it. I will find it for you right now. Give me a minute. And obviously, we pray to Akadosh Baruch Hu that they find a solution and nothing goes further. There are thousands of people stranded in the middle of the ocean, in different cruise ships, 6,000 people, 7,000 people, because there are a few individuals affected by this condition. Now, how long can you survive in the middle of the ocean? How much food they have and how much sanitation they have to go? So we hope and pray to the Almighty that things will fix right away. Now, the Pasuk tells us, 
I want you to listen to this. And I will show you in the video so you can watch it in the big screen in a moment. The Torah in last week's Torah portion talks about the requirements for Korban Pesach, the Pesach sacrifice. The Torah says, You will eat the meat in the night of Pesach. Seli Esh, it needs to be roasted. Umasot, with Masot, Al Merorim Yocheluhu. Eat it Pesach, Masa Umaror, like we do every night of Pesach in the Seder. Comes the next Pasuk, and please pay attention to the Pasuk. I'm not going to translate the Pasuk, I'm going to read the Pasuk, and I'm going to read Rashi. And pay attention to the words. Al tochelu mimenu na. Ubashel mevushal bamaim ki im seli esh. Rashi says, Al tochelu mimenu na. She eno salui kol sorcho. Koro na. I'm going to show it to you black and white. So you don't say that I'm making this up. When I read this, this verse and I said, Al tochelu mimenu na. Let's ask anybody born in Israel here that speaks Hebrew fluently, you in Israel, what does it mean in Hebrew, na? Please, that's all it means. El na refa na la. Na means please. But comes Rashi and it says, in food, the Torah calls it, and I'm going to show you right away. Get, the, get my finger on the screen. Do you read it? Read it back. Sheeno salui, that is not cooked or roasted sufficiently. Corona. Corona. Guys, you see it? Belashon Arabi. This is, now you may say, Rabbi, the word koro means calls them. And na means raw. But I ask you a question now. From all the words that you can choose to write this Rashi a thousand years ago, he picks the word corona. If it's me writing, I will have written, Kol she'eno salui kol sorcho, ha Torah omeret na. But Rashi said, koro na. A thousand years ago. Rabotai, obviously, we are believers. We are believers. And we understand that the pathways of the Torah, as the Pasuk says, Derajeha darche noam, bechol netivoteha shalom. Every message, every fence, every guideline of the Torah that we receive, and I'm not talking only about Am Israel, but even for the nations of the world, there is a benefit that comes to it. So, Be'ezat Hashem, let us hope and pray that those who eat, Live animals, they should stop eating live animals. I'm not talking about any of us, but I will tell you a secret. I will tell you a secret that don't neglect the prohibition of eating bugs, bugs, insects. Relax. If people don't check the vegetables, some of the vegetables do contain insects. Perhaps you don't see it. You believe because it's organic and non-GMO is ashgaha. That's not ashgaha. Organic and non-GMO, it is not a supervision of kashrut. It is only a certain standard that doesn't have insecticides or pesticides and whatever things they, they, they spray upon the fruits and the vegetables. But when the Torah devotes the concept of bedikat tolaim, the searching for bugs in food, 
it is not for no reason. Not only it affects the spirit, but also it affects the body as well. So with that being said, we're going to move now to another topic. The short topic that we'll discuss today is the topic of emuna. And I talk about it simply because the Torah mentions they believed in Moshe and they believed in Hashem and they believed in Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, why the Torah? If a person believes in Hashem, isn't that enough that a person has faith in God? So the truth of the matter is that having faith in Hashem is fundamental and not negotiable. Obviously, we have a Munay in Kadosh Baruch Hu, but we cannot minimize the importance of a Munat Hachamim, having faith in our Hachamim, our faith in our Torah. And I'm sure you know what I'm going to say now. There was a great rabbi, uh, and I think it's appropriate to mention it today, by the name of Rebbe Levi of Bardichov. Bardichev, I'm sure you heard of him. He was nicknamed as Sanegoran Shel Israel, the advocate of the Jewish people. He will always look for the goodness. He will always look for the positive, even in the face of adversity. That's a beautiful midah to have. I think that we all need to make an effort to emulate his ways, even in the face of darkness, for him, it was light. So I will share with the Kahal Kadosh a very brief prayer that he wrote. And thousands upon thousands of Jewish people recite this prayer every Mosai Shabbat, including the speaker. I'll, show it, I'll share it with you very briefly. We all know that Mosai Shabbat, Saturday night, it's a very powerful night of the week. Why? Short answer is because that is the beginning of the physical week. Even though we already experience Shabbat, and at the end of Shabbat, we wish, we wish each other Shavua Tov Umeborach. But the reason why we say Shavua Tov Umeborach is because we are entering into the physical slash financial week. So many people have different traditions on Mosai Shabbat, which I believe many of the people here listening and in the room follow it religiously. One of them is to say, Ve'iten lecha. There is a prayer found in most Sidurim, i rather say all Sidurim on Mosai Shabbat. It's called Ve'iten lecha ha'elokim. This prayer of Ve'iten lecha is a composition or recopilation of many Pesukim from the Torah Nevi'im Ketubim. They are Pesukim of blessings at all levels, physical, financial, emotional, family, marriage. And at the end of these 30, 40 verses, doesn't take long time to say, we finish with the ultimate blessing, the blessing of peace. As the Pasuk says in Shemuel, This Pasuk is on the book of Shemuel. And this verse, it speaks about Shalom. Peace with yourself. You need to be at peace with yourself. Then you need to be at peace with your wife, with your family. And then... Once these two elements are in the proper track, the Pasuk gives us a guarantee. Bechol asher lecha, shalom. And everything that you will do and have in your life will be crowned with success and peace. How many times we say this verse? Seven times. Because you need peace every day of the week. You cannot say, I need peace between 10 and 12 p.m. You're not a bank that closes for a siesta. Or you're going to take a nap. Don't call me from 1 to 3 or 1 to 4. 
okay? Actually, we need this blessing every day. Then, there is another blessing that many people say, perhaps less than Ve'iten Lecha, the prayer to open the gates. Opening the gates, it's here. It's in the Kol Yaakov Sidur, a generic blessing of well-being for us, individually and collectively, a week of all good things, and then you open up all the gates, the gates of blessings, the gates of beracha, of joy, of wisdom, happiness, all, you know, like 30, 40 gates. All this is beautiful. Comes the great Rebbe Levi Ishak of Bardichov, and he adds another prayer. And I'm going to read it to you quickly, because it's a very powerful prayer. That goes as follows. This is known as the prayer of Eloke Abraham. So I'm going to go straight into English so we save some time. God of Abraham is Hakan Yaakov. Protect and save your nation Israel, your beloved one, from all evil. Has the Shabbat Holy One the beloved one, came to an end, let it be that this week may come upon us to complete faith in the Almighty, to faith in our hachamim, to love among the friends, to bonding with the Almighty, to believe in the 13 principles of faith, their speedy redemption in our days, Mashiach's arrival, that means, the the resurrection of the dead, and the prophecies of Moshe Rabbeinu, alav shalom, master of the universe. You give to the tired person strength. Give also to your beloved Jewish children power to praise you, to express their gratitude, and to serve you specifically. And let it be that this week should come upon us with health, with good mazal, for blessing, for success, for compassion, kindness, for the well-being of our children, for longevity, for plenty of abundance of parnasah, and heavenly help for us and the entire Jewish people. Ben Omar, Amen. Amen. Short prayer, but very powerful. Very powerful. Now, Emunat hachamim. It's a requirement. Let me ask you a question. What do you do when you have to make a decision and you don't know where to go? Most of the time, you come to the rabbi. You don't come to the rabbi if you need to make a decision. Rabbi, should I eat meat or should I eat dairy? Obviously, you don't need the rabbi to help you with that, correct? But when it comes to halachic questions, you have a question of halacha, you have a question of business, you have a question of ethics, you have a question of shalom bayit, you have a question of family purity, you have a question of nida, you have a question of hinuch. What do you do? Who are you going to call? Don't tell me Ghostbusters. <laughs> I know. Who are you going to call? The rabbi. That's why the Mishnah says in Pirkei Avot, Ase Lecha Rav. No, Rabbanim. What the Mishnah said? Make yourself one rabbi. It doesn't mean that if you're visiting Miami, and you want to ask me, Rabbi, what's the good ashgaha? Or Rabbi, what time is the minyanim? Is the problem. But when you're talking about serious questions related to life that you need assistance to make a decision, you need to be always in connection with one rabbi that knows you. Many times people approach me with questions. I get questions all the time, every day. It hardly goes a day that questions don't come. I already have questions <coughs> waiting for me upstairs. And it's only 9.30, 9.40 in the morning. But Baruch Hashem, people, I'm accessible, I'm available, and people, especially 
the full-time members and residents, they know me already. But let's say that you come to me, okay, and you're going to ask me a very challenging or difficult question. You know what will be my first question to you? Who is your rabbi? First of all, that will tell me, more or less, which pathway are you following? My second question to you will be, did you ask your rabbi? In other words, I cannot, unless the question comes referred by another rabbi that happens, like I ask questions to big rabbis, younger rabbis ask me questions. So I will ask you this question. Why? Somebody asked me, why do you do that, rabbi? I want to know your opinion. It says, first of all, I know you only as a tourist. I don't know who you are. I don't know what, it, <coughs> what is your marriage stance. What is your family dynamics? And you're asking me to give you an answer so you make a decision on something that I should not be involved. You understand? And that's why the Torah in today's perasha says it. Bayaminu ba'ashem u'moshe havdo. You can have faith in Hashem. But I ask you a question. Did you ever ask a question to God? Did you? And what did he answer you? Okay, you're a holy man. <laughs> <coughs> we pray. We pray. And we need to decipher the answer. Unless obvious, it's an obvious answer. But many, many times, you don't know the answer. You don't know what to do. And that's why the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot says, Ase lecha rav, ukne lecha haver. Buy yourself a friend. What does it mean, buying a friend? It's a Mishnah in Pirkei Avot. Make sure that you are connected with a good friend. Why? Because friends have an influence in the life of the person. Like it or not, if the friends are good, you are good influence. But if the friends are not good, let's say you want to do something special, you want to move up a step closer to Hashem, <coughs> excuse me, but your environment really doesn't contemplate promotions. They are happy where they are. So guess what? The friends, to a certain extent, are preventing the person of growing. I'm not telling you not to have friends, but the Mishnah is telling you, remember that the friends can influence you more than a person thinks and believes. Beautiful message from the Torah of today. Let's talk about food now. Food and emuna. How do we get from food to emuna? That's what the Zohar of today says. The Zohar says in the introduction, <coughs> excuse me. One of the ways that we honor the Shabbat is with food. We all agree on that, correct? Irrelevant of the level of observance of the Shabbat and irrelevant of the menu, we all know that Shabbat is a special day. And we eat special foods on Shabbat. We eat more elegant food, perhaps. <coughs> more elegant setup. <coughs> Excuse me. We eat more, perhaps. We spend time longer on the table. No rush. No cell phones to disturb us. Perhaps to many of us, maybe the only day in the week that we are able to sit down with the family without interruptions to enjoy a Shabbat meal. Why? Because people have different schedules and different work habits. And therefore, during the week, maybe the kitchen becomes a restaurant. Everyone eats at a different time. But on Shabbat... We all eat together. Comes the Zohar Kadosh 
and it says that when a Yehudi sits down to eat in the Sa'udot of Shabbat, a couple of things we need to have into consideration. The Zohar says, number one, there is a tremendous amount of sanctity and holiness that comes to the Shabbat table in honor of Shabbat. Where do we learn it from? From the Kiddush. What's the meaning of the word Kiddush? To sanctify. To sanctify means Kodesh. Kodesh, holy. So when a person eats the Sauda of the Shabbat, the Zohar Kadosh says, that is a moment of sanctity for everyone on the table. Not only that, the Zohar says two more things. One, the Zohar says that when a person eats in honor of Shabbat, we are charging our batteries of emuna. Why? Because we are strengthening the bonding with the Kadosh Baruch Hu. And the Zohar says one more thing. That the gift of Shabbat is only for Am Israel. It's a pasuk. Beni uben bene Israel ot hi le'olam. It's a covenant for Am Israel. There was a great rabbi by the name of Rabbi Yaakov Abu Hasira. Alava shalom. He wrote, he's the one buried in the Manhur, in Egypt. He wrote many books, and one of the books was called, is called, rather, Pitohe Hotam. There he writes that if a person has a possibility of eating leftover food from Shabbat during the week, to eat it. Why? Of course, we all eat it. Hazaku Baruch. It says, because leftovers of food cooked in honor of Shabbat, they still carry the sanctity of the Shabbat. I'm sure the ladies, the ladies are very happy to hear this. You don't have to cook anymore. That's it. Cook once a week. And if your husband tells you something, you tell them the rabbi said to eat <laughs> leftover from Shabbat. I agree with you on that. If you reheat the mahshi or the cholen, whatever food you eat, two times, malochia, two times, three times, four times, somehow the flavor sits better and better. But at least you can eat it till Tuesday. I gave you, I give you guidelines, okay? Why Tuesday? Because till Tuesday night, the aura of the Shabbat that finish still travels the world. That's why the Allah says, if a person did not make Abdallah on Mosai Shabbat, you can do it till Tuesday night. Tuesday night is the deadline for, after, for Abdallah. So if Tuesday night is the deadline for Abdallah, Tuesday night is the deadline for leftover food. Fair enough, gentlemen. You're happy now? Okay. Correct. You need to make Abdallah. You must make Abdallah. Let's continue. Technically speaking, yes. He can drink water. But Baruch Hashem, most people, Baruch Hashem, today do Abdallah right away. So the Zohar Kadosh, with this introduction, talks about the importance of making sure that our checklist on Shabbat gets an A+. Plus. What is the Zohar referring to? The importance of having three Sa'udot during Shabbat. And we do this. We have Friday night Shabbat dinner, Shabbat lunch, and Sa'uda Shelishit. That is a given. But Sa'uda Shelishit, many people are very light about it. They're very light. They take a fruit, and that's enough. Maybe in certain cases, maybe enough. But the Zohar says that a person needs to make sure 
that we don't have an incomplete Shabbat by not having three Sa'udot of Shabbat. That's what the Zohar says. And therefore it says, there are benefits when a person eats the three Sa'udot. The Gemara writes this in Masechet Shabbat. Din shel Gehinnam, Heble Mashiach, Umilhemet Gog Umagog. The Gemara writes in Masechet Shabbat, whoever does three Sa'udot during the Shabbat, the person will be spurred of three challenging moments in the person's life. Number one, the judgment after 120 years. We all gonna go through judgment. It's not custom made, you yes, you not. Most people, could be some exceptions, but most people are gonna be judged on the actions they did, etc. So part of the benefit of Buying compassion is reinforcing Teresa Udot on Shabbat. Why? Because we are certifying, the Zohar says, our emuna in Akadosh Baruch Hu. And I'm going to tell you one thing that may sound a bit strange. The Shabbat night meal connects to Ishaq Avinu. Shabbat lunch connects to Abraham Avinu. And Sa'uda Shelishit connects to whom? Yaakov. I'm going to ask you a heavy, fully loaded question. From the three meals, which one is the most relevant to us? Shabbat dinner, Shabbat lunch, or Sa'uda Shelishit? Sa'uda Shelishit. Sa'uda Shelishit is the most instrumental of our Shabbat. Why? Short answer. Because we are students of Yaakov. Even though we are descendants of Abraham and Ishaq, but a Jew must be closer to Yaakov than anyone else. Why? Not only Bnei Israel, but Yaakov Avinu represented the Torah. If you remember, back then in Perashah Bereshit, the Torah tells us about the struggle of Yaakov with the Malach of Esav. Did you ever ask yourself why this confrontation happened only to Yaakov Avinu? Why not to Abraham? Why not to Ishaq? But yes to Yaakov? Very simple. Hakol, kol Yaakov. The method of survival of Am Israel is Torah learning. It's not tefillah. It's not kindness. Of course, tefillah, kindness, and Torah learning sustain the world. But if somebody asks you, what is requirement number one in the life of a Yehudi? Hakol, kol, Yaakov. The voice of Yaakov Avinu. What was the voice of Yaakov Avinu? The sound of the Torah like we are doing now, and like we do every day. And that's why the Zora Kadosh writes, the other two benefits are going to be the birth pains of Mashiach's arrival. Birth pains are usually related to a lady giving birth. But there is one more area that the Torah calls it birth pains, Mashiach's arrival. The confusion that exists in the world. The drama that exists in the world. If it's in the world of politics, what's happening in Israel, what's happening in America, what's happening in the world with this virus, with terrorism, anti-Semitism, all these are, as we heard from the great Chief Rabbi Amar when he was here, these are stepping stones to Mashiach's arrival. Because it only reinforces every aspect and element of the Torah. And then we have Milhemet Gog Umagog. This war, Milhemet Gog Umagog, is one of the prophecies that our Nevi'im mentioned in the Navi about a mega war that will happen 
prior to Mashiach's arrival. But we need to clarify that this war that the Nevi'im are talking about is not necessarily connected to a physical war. It's a war of the mind. For example, today, the 21st century, what is the biggest fears of the governments of every nation of the world? Short answer, cyber attack. You can stop a country, you can destroy a country, all the infrastructure, the banking system, you can shut down airports, transportation. I don't want to go further, but I think that you get the message from a computer. Correct? This is the challenges of today. Today you cause more damage. You know, even when they hack a computer, how they call it? Computer virus. Why they use the word virus? Because it's everything that is inside. Hazao Baruch. According to some opinions, this is Gog Umagog. Seeking the destruction of mankind without lifting a finger, without a bomb. Eventually, the drama will happen. Another explanation that talks about Gog Umagog, I said this many weeks ago, but I said it again. The word Gog is from the word Gag. Gag in Hebrew, what does it mean? Roof. Usually the gag is the highest position in a house, in a building, the rooftop. So gog umagog, gag megag, that prior to Mashiach's arrival, the wars will be of the intellect, the wars of the mind. The world today promotes different levels of behaviors and attitudes that the worse they are, the more popular they are. Right? Social media today. It may be a multi-billion, trillion, quadrillion business for advertisements, etc. But how many lives social media ruins daily? Daily through bullying, through social suicides, and God forbid, the, 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 I don't, I don't want to say the names so nobody gets ideas and starts looking for them, but the different games out there that dare you to do crazy things. You know what I'm talking about? All right? Better. But if you don't know better, Hazako Baruch. You sleep better that night. Okay? So this is also... A war of the minds. So how we survive all these three challenging moments? The Zohar of today says, Saudot in Shabbat. Saudot in Shabbat. Be happy during the Sauda. Say a few words of Torah during the Sauda. Be careful with Obviously, Sa'udah Shelishit and the Zohar brings also the Yom Tov. How important it is also to make sure to help the needy to be able to celebrate Shabbat and holidays properly. And the Zohar Kadosh concludes and it says that one of the reasons why on Shabbat we eat more is because on Shabbat we receive something known as Neshama Yetera the additional neshama that comes on the Shabbat. Like in marriage, the soul of the husband and the soul of the wife supplements each other. Also on the day of Shabbat, today we are, let's call it 50% performance. Shabbat Kodesh comes, the Zohar says, now our neshama is full-fledged. 
That's why we pray more. We eat more. We learn more Torah. We spend good time with the family and in the synagogue. And the Zohar Kadosh writes that the Neshama achieves a level known as Shelemut. Shelemut means completion. That is the reason why on Mosai Shabbat, when we make the Havdalah, what Berachah do we say? Bore mine besamim. What do we say, Bore mine besamim? So the Neshama lives through the Mitzvah. Why? Because smell and music are two benefits to the Neshama, to the soul. Sound of music and smell affect the soul. That's why according to the Benishai and many Kabbalistic writings, also on a Friday night, the person should say Besamim. Some synagogues, they give it in the Knis. Some synagogues do it at home. I do it at home. But I remember in Argentina, as a child, the Gabbai used to stand by the door, right? And they used to give the perfume or whatever they had, Besamim. In Israel, they give you Hadassim. You go to the synagogue, they give you the Hadassim to smell because smelling is something that has nothing to do with the body, but has everything to do with the soul. You smell through your nose. Where the Neshama comes in to the body? Through the nose. Where the Neshama leaves the body? Through the nose. That's why when somebody sneezes, what do you say? Salud. Haim tovim. Why? Gesundheit. Aish. What do you say all that? Because in the olden days, up to the arrival of Yaakov Avinu, death was estornudar. Death was caused by sneezing. Because when you sneeze, you release. What did you release back then? The Neshama. Until Yaakov Avinu says to the Almighty, Dear God, please, Dachilak, Rohi, it's not fair. A person sneezes, and that's it. Why don't you send a warning? Send a medical condition, send certain illness, so the person can plan. The person can prepare the family. The person can make all the legal arrangements necessary before he leaves the world. God says, you gave me a good idea. You will be the first customer in the world to become sick. <laughs> and the Torah says it. By you godly Yaakov, by you godly Yosef, Lemor, Hine Avicha Hole. Yosef was informed that his father was sick. This was different than Abraham that was experiencing the pain of the Mila. This was a temporary pain due to the circumcision. But Yaakov Avinu was on the bed. And this was God answering the request of Yaakov to prepare him to the final days in this world. Right? And that's why the Zohar Kadosh writes and it says the concept of Shabbat. What is the meaning of Shabbat? The Zohar says, listen to this. Shemo Shekadosh Baruchu. One of the names of God is Shabbat. And the other name of God, Shehu Shalom. So when you say to another Yehudi, Shabbat Shalom, you are saying Hashem Hashem. You're using the password. Shabbat Shalom. Password. And it says as Zohar Kadosh, what's the meaning of Shalom? Shalem. Completion. The Shabbat completes the week of the person. And that's why I'll finish with this. Nothing to do with the topic that I'm talking about, but I think it's important to understand why things are done in the world. In the Ashkenazic tradition, 
there is a very interesting custom that when a child is born, when the child is born, what they do, people come Friday night to the house of the baby. How is it called? Shalom Zohar. I'll translate. The Sephardic tradition is the night before the Mila, we congregate in the house where the baby is and we read the Zohar. Right? Beautiful. In the Ashkenazic tradition, there is such a costume as well, but the main Ashkenazic tradition is Shalom Zachar, that people come to the house of the baby to wish the parents Mazel Tov. But how is it called this event? Shalom, peace, Zachar, on the boy. Now, why is it called this way? Shalom, Zachar. Not only that, the menu of that night is not dinner. I'm coming to the chickpeas soon. It's dessert. That's the menu. But among the desserts, you're going to see on the table chickpeas. Arbes in Yiddish. Garbanzos. The question is, why they serve such a food, which usually is food of Avelim, is food of mourners? I'll tell you the reason why. The guests that come to this home Friday night, they come to console the baby. They come to console the baby. Why? What happened? The baby is born. It's happiness. It's happiness for all of us, but it's not happiness for the baby. Why? Because the baby was learning Torah with the Malach during the nine months of pregnancy. And now he came to the world. And the baby is not happy. He's not happy. So we come to the baby on a Shabbat and we say, Shalom, Zachar, not to worry. We have Shabbat in our life. You have Shalom in your life and you're going to be good, Be'ezat Hashem. And, and this is one of the reasons why, by the way, why Mila takes place on the eighth day besides all the spiritual reasons, but we're going to give a sample to the Neshama to live one week without, one Shabbat exactly, one Shabbat throughout life without the Berit Milah. So the Neshama experiences before and after. Seven days is the guideline for life. What does it mean? Obviously, people live years. Be'ezat Hashem. But at the end of the day, how does the week work? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. What happens after Shabbat? We go back to Sunday. In the dates, it's easy. The first, the second, the third, 30, 31st. And you have month. But the weekdays, how many weekdays are there? Seven. So the reality of life is that life is seven days only multiplied certain amount of weeks. So we give the child the opportunity to live one complete week, which is the minimum aspect of life, and only then we do the Berit Mila. Besides the fact of the medical benefits that happen to the baby's body on the eighth day, but I figure that it's important to understand, you know, the different traditions that exist in the world. My good friends, I'd like to wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Hananiah ben